Ready to pop the question? The jewelers at BlueNile.com have got sparkle down to a science with beautiful lab-grown diamonds worthy of your most brilliant moments. Their lab-grown diamonds are independently graded and guaranteed identical to natural diamonds, and they're ready to ship to your door. Go to BlueNile.com and use promo code LISTEN to get $50 off your purchase of $500 or more. That's code LISTEN at BlueNile.com for $50 off. BlueNile.com, code LISTEN. G'day and welcome back to Shares for Beginners. Now, my guest today is Ted Richards. You know, my investment philosophy now is not trying to put all my eggs in one basket and try and pick the next best performing asset class, but rather taking a diversified view and and getting exposure to multiple asset classes. Ted Richards is a behavioural economics investment expert. He runs the Richards Report Money Podcast and is a former AFL player for the Sydney Swans and Essendon. Ted's currently the Director of Business Development at robo-advice startup Six Park. Now, Ted, you didn't waste your time playing footy, did you? I, I hope not. Well, you, you picked up a Bachelor of Commerce from the University of New South Wales and then went on to complete your Masters of Business Administration in Finance. Did you have any time for fun? Well, I, yeah, I actually found that I, I played my best football when I was distracted and that I wasn't thinking about football too much. So I always just wanted to knock over a, a, a bachelor degree I was actually playing really good football while I was doing it, and uh, I thought, well, whilst I'm still playing, why not start the Masters? And I ended up finishing it, and uh, once I finished that, I decided to, um, even though I was still playing, um, work in the industry. So admittedly, uh, it was only one day a week on my day off from football, but I started working under a fund manager and learning from him and studying stocks. Um, You had some money to invest when you were quite young playing football and you made a few mistakes can you tell me about that yeah sure so I was drafted when I was 17 just uh, just finished year 12 and um in the AFL system when you're drafted very lucky enough to uh, come into a bit of money for uh someone of that age and so um I looked at different options you know cash in the bank being one of them and and dad who's not from the industry um gave me a book called one up on wall street which is a bit of a classic and it's about investing in the market it was written by Peter Lynch one Up on Wall Street, very briefly, is all about how you can outperform the professionals and when it comes to investing. But um, I, I ended up losing a bit of money in it. What, what, what were some of the mistakes you made? The, the investment that I made, and this is going back well, close to 20 years now, was in a company called Pacific Brands. And Peter Lynch, he, he, one of his um, suggestions is, um, is about noticing trends and fads and, and looking into them and, and, and doing a bit of um, research. And I'd, I'd kind of noticed that I was, I was starting to see Bonds undies everywhere. I looked into it and I found out that uh, Bonds is actually owned at the time by a company called Pacific Brands. And what I didn't do was you know proper due diligence and, and actually look into the financials and, and look into what percentage of profitability bonds actually brings to the parent company of Pacific Brands. And even though my thinking was actually correct in that bonds was actually performing quite well, I didn't look into the fact that Pacific Brands at the time owned a lot of other companies that weren't performing well that contributed much in bigger amounts to Pacific Brands share price and subsequently even though Bonds was growing in popularity Pacific Brands stock price kept on going backwards but uh, I call it a an expensive lesson I I should say that there has been a lot of changes within the industry about how people can get invested in the market most notably with exchange traded funds growing in popularity and index funds because the reality is is picking stocks be it an amateur or even a professional, is really hard and it takes a lot of time. The reality is 90% of active fund managers actually underperform the benchmark. We always seem to be coming to ETFs now because, uh, you know, it makes it so much easier to get exposure to a broad range of stocks. And and one of the main things we find with uh, shares for beginners is that people don't, you know, they, they need a diversified portfolio and you get it automatically with an ETF. Yeah, so an ETF can get you exposure to um, stocks and asset classes that might be outside of your circle of competence. But at the same time, if you if you were really interested in proper research into an individual stock, you, you know there are some real questions 
that you'd want to know the answers to that take time to learn about um, looking at balance sheets and trying to associate the risks that may be inherent there. And more often than not, risks and balance sheets comes down to the debt. And then you want to be able to tick off the business model and form a view as to disruption to the business model and, and, and what the future of that business model might look like. It, it gets hard for mum and dad investors to form a view on management because I guess the people making the decisions about the, the company, you need to have a trust in them that they've got a track record that you, uh, you're you comfortable with. And then, then, you know, those three steps are hard in itself. But the last step of all, which, you know, this is just a four-step process that I've used in the past, is on the valuation. And that's in inherently complicated as to whether you're going to use a PE multiple, a discounted cash flow, or an EV multiple. And, and I know that I apologise, I'm using a lot of jargon there, but this is just... Oh, I'm going, to grill you. I'm going to grill you on them, uh, Ted. Yeah, well, I apologise, but like, this is just just the the ways that people you know dig deep into balance sheets, P&Ls, and mm-hmm. income statements, and, and, and all the financial statements um, to form a view of an educated view as to what the company might look like in the next few years. And um, a gut instinct isn't good enough. What is your four-step process? It's something that I no longer use. I, I, I now invest mostly passively i get exposure to um different asset classes with index funds i think concentrating on my asset allocation is far more important than stock selection and so many people i really just focus in on two forms of asset classes when it comes to investing one of which we all love is australian property australians just uh, manic about the property market but the other is australian equities but there's actually you know, other asset classes out there like infrastructure, bonds, exposure to emerging markets or US shares. And it's you know, my investment philosophy now is not trying to put all my eggs in one basket and try and pick the next best performing asset class, but rather taking a diversified view and, and getting exposure to multiple asset classes. So there is a, um, a smoothing of my overall return and not as much inherent risk as um, some portfolios have that may just load up on, for example, an Australian bank, an Australian miner, and possibly an Australian supermarket and um, think that they're diversified. Yep, yep, just getting something from each sector. Yeah. So if I'm hearing you correctly here, then you're, you're not um, picking any individual stocks. You, you're you looking for different asset classes. Now, can you talk, talk to me then about what these asset classes are and how you would access them as an investor yeah sure so for example let's let's use the um to get exposure to the australian share market with one single trade is just buy an index so for example the asx 200 but then there's examples which are i guess a bit more sophisticated because of how you can get exposure to emerging markets and emerging markets contains countries like china india eastern europe and Latin America, it's probably considered a bit more of a riskier investment. So it'll come with a bit more volatility, but you know the returns can be much greater than um, other asset classes. So what we've seen in, with emerging markets in 2017 was it had a fantastic year, returning mid to low 20s in terms of percentage. 2018, it, it's come back a bit. So it'll be interesting to see how it goes, but it's not about trying to time the market. It's taking a, a long-term view and, and Using emerging markets is just one portion of your overall portfolio. And so you've got some growth assets there like equities, but you've also got defensive assets to bonds and global property and infrastructure, which you know, infrastructure are things like toll roads. And um, yeah, they may not be cool and exciting like a Facebook or a Netflix, but they've got a steady cash flow. Exactly. You're exactly right that um, depending on where you are in Australia, uh, Transurban is uh, one of the major toll road operators in Australia and, and got, has toll roads also in the US, I believe, too. And they, they're quite resilient, those cash flows, like you touched on. And um, uh, if there is you know, a crash around the corner, you, your portfolio has a bit of a resilience to it to withstand um, those, those pullbacks in the market. Can you talk to me a little bit about bonds, what they are and how you would use them? Because we're getting confused with uh, bonds as in uh, Pacific brands and bonds underwear and so forth. <laughs> yeah, very, very true. And then, yeah. we, 
And then we're talking about corporate bonds and government bonds. Yeah, so uh, I can remember reading a, a little joke about Albert Einstein goes to heaven and um, as he's walking into the, through St Peter's gates, God taps Einstein on the shoulder and says to him, can you tell me how the bond market works? And um, I guess that's that, yeah, that little anecdote is just a, a reference to you know, the bond market and how the pricing of bonds can be a bit more sophisticated than the pricing of, say, a company like Bonds or a, a newspaper or something like that. And there's many things that, that take into account, you know, the, the pricing of a bond. But the quality of the bond ultimately comes back to the level of risk associated with that bond and the likelihood. So a government bond, presumably, is not very risky. Yeah, well, yeah, it depends on what government, but, um, you know, and that, that's why I think... It, <laughs> there, there is governments and there's governments, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, you wouldn't compare an Australian government bond, and I think we might still be AAA in Australia, and the likelihood of us defaulting on that bond, say, compared to Argentina or um, yeah, even uh, Venezuela. But what, what bonds can provide is a bit more of a defensive, regular, safer level of returns, but a higher return above, um, say, an online cash deposit. With Staples Business Advantage, you get the benefit of thousands of experts. Plus optimizations powered by the latest technological innovations. One plus one equals two. Three. Whatever. Sign up today and save 20%. Staples Business Advantage. Business is human. So talk to me a little bit about um, behavioural economics, which you studied at university. I wanted to you know, do more study into behavioural economics because I could see so much of our education and what we've been speaking with clients is about logical, rational things about diversification, keeping your fees low, asset allocation, stock selection... But uh, the reality is, you know, that, that's a view of economics that we're all rational. But we know that as humans, we're, we're not always rational, that we, we do make decisions in life that uh, don't make sense. And um, we've evolved to make decisions two ways, which some of your listeners may be aware of, of this, this way of viewing it. Um, it was made famous probably most notably by Amos Dravesky and Daniel Kahneman, and that there's system one and system two. The system one way of thinking is very fast. It's very intuitive. The system two way is is a bit slower. It's a bit more reflective. Yeah, this system one way of thinking and making decisions has been fantastic to ensure that we can evolve and survive. So back in the day as a caveman, we see a, a potential threat. Our adrenal gland releases adrenaline, which has been great to ensure that we can handle situations like that. But it, it's it is the worst possible reaction when it comes to things like investing. We almost predictably make irrational decisions. I'm assuming that system two thinking is going to get, make you a bit more rational yeah. and help you make yeah, decisions. Yeah, so yeah, it's, it's probably the obvious question is, well, why don't we always make decisions with the system two approach, which is slow and reflective? But the reality is what well, we wouldn't have evolved like that because, say, for example, uh, we're crossing the street and there's a bus coming. Um, if we're always reliant on system two, we'd stand there and would weigh up the pros and cons of moving and whether we should move or we shouldn't. And before, you know, that they, we wouldn't be able to react as quickly as we can to, to make important decisions. So that's, that's one aspect. But the other aspect is we're not always aware of how we're making decisions, whether it's system one or system two. So I can um, also touch on some of these these biases that we have which um yeah tell us tell us about some of these biases yeah so i'm I'm sure your listeners have been aware of these because it's um i'm I'm seeing it right now in the media a lot especially with confirmation bias i do this myself we all do this we usually put the confirmation first and then search for evidence to support that confirmation and we discount anything that contradicts that confirmation so uh, another big bias when it comes to investing is loss aversion and um, and loss aversion is so powerful in that we perceive losses they're twice as powerful as the feeling that we get when we um, receive something so unfortunately it's not a switch we can just trigger and go i'm no longer affected by loss aversion i think what we need to do there is just be aware that 
when we see a loss in our portfolio, whether it's a stock or an ETF or, or whatever it is, be aware that we will react a certain way. And um, as if I go back to um, evolution, once you know we're we're in the desert uh, or you know wherever we are in, in evolution, you lose something you know that's important to you you may not survive as opposed to if you you gain something so i think that's that's the origins about why this this emotion that we have when we lose things is so powerful and the dangers of looking at your portfolio and your investments too much will exacerbate the um the power of loss aversion because if you're investing say let's let's say in um company a for with the intention of investing it for five to ten years but you're looking at your portfolio every day well the market pretty much goes up and down but your psychology won't respond the same way some other biases that we're, we're influenced by that i think listeners might be aware of is recency bias in that we we put a greater emphasis on things that have happened more recently than things that may have happened in the distant past and Actually, what's what's something that's quite recent in the news? Well, Australian property market, um, mm. it looks like, is you know in Sydney and Melbourne has gone backwards, and people may be uh, putting more of an emphasis over that as opposed to you know zooming out a little and looking at how property has performed as an asset class over multiple decades, and and I guess putting more emphasis on that as opposed to what might have happened in the last six months. And uh, another bias that we have is. Um, it's called false memory and um, we all like to think that we've got a fantastic memory where um, events are actually and correctly ingrained in our mind but what we're finding what the research says is that our memory when it uh, is actually more of a bit more of a, like a an etch a sketch in that we uh, for those investors that were invested in the market back in um, the financial crisis of 2008 and 2009 might think that they actually ha- handled, you know, the uh, the crash quite well, and that that it's never going to happen again to them, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But we do know that the best indication as to how someone's going to perform in the next crash is not what they think will happen, but actually how they behaved in the in the most recent crash. Can you explain to me about robo advice and what it is and how it can be used? The term robo advice is a, is a bit of a, a horrible term, but um, in reality, it's just sa- the same as normal investment management. But instead of being done face to face, it's it's done online. So um, there's there's no sophisticated AI to it at all. It is just getting people um, um, invested according to their risk profile, managing the portfolio for them, and doing it all for a low fee. So is it like going to see a financial planner? Is that the way it works? It's not holistic financial advice, but for people that want to get invested in the market, what Six Park and other other online investment providers can provide is um, a way to set up their own globally diversified portfolio over multiple asset classes, like I touched on before, from Australian shares to bonds to international shares and, and infrastructure, and then going forward, once that investment recommendation has been made, is to um, manage the portfolio. So we've got clients all over Australia from people starting off with you know, investments of around $10,000. And what we charge someone at $10,000 is just $50 a year. We've also got clients with us that have multiple millions of dollars that uh, are aware that one of the most important things that they can make is trying to keep their fees as low as they can. So what do you say to people who might have trust issues with the idea of robo-advice? What I usually say is that it's just the same as normal investment management, um, that the, the, that robo-term is, is a bit of a misnomer. The fact that we're not face-to-face, like um, typically our clients might receive with a, a face-to-face financial advisor, means that it's, it's not, a, not a, a negative. It can, can be a positive in that the fees that uh, they pay for our service is a fraction of what they um, might typically provide, So, which is fantastic because we, we do know that roughly only 20% of Australians can get professional investment help. Why is that? Well, I think it's because of how expensive it is to provide compliant investment advice. 
usually with all the um, complexities and legalities involved is so expensive that for someone with you know fifty to a hundred thousand dollars or even less than that it may not be worthwhile financial advisor providing that client advice because once you take into account the the cost for a statement of advice to set up accounts for the risk assessment execute the trades manage the portfolio and provide all the reporting it's taking the financial advisor a lot of time and 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 they they can't really charge much for it whereas we're disrupting investment management and um, unfortunately there were many many sad stories that came out of the royal commission where people were receiving investment advice that had high fees a lot of conflicts so we see ourselves as someone that's bringing robo advice to australia with a, a new solution full transparency no conflicts low fees and i think that's one of the fantastic things uh, you know with your podcast and, and others is it can really break down some barriers and break down some jargon and educate people so that they can have a bit more of an informed decision and point of view and have some conversations and ask the relevant questions about important things like their retirement because uh, without being too romantic I quite enjoy helping people with significant important things like the quality of life that they can have in their retirement and you know, it's a it's a major concern that many Australians have, and um, it's it's sad to hear people that get to retirement age and don't know where to look for help. You know, so many people might get allured and attracted to what potential returns might be, but what we do know is, you know, the power of compound returns are fantastic. But Jack Bogle talks about the the tyranny of what compound fees can do to your portfolio. So Fees are that important? Yeah. Fee, fees are one of the few things you can actually have real control over because if you're investing in assets like, you know, the share market or property, you know, the reality is that these things come with a, an element of risk and a bit of volatility from, you know, month to month, year to year. But what you can control is the fees that you'll pay. What I'd ask a financial planner is, well, what are you offering that robo-advice isn't? Yeah, and, um, you know, to, to, to be fully upfront, you know, a robo-advice or, you know, online investment management like Six Park, we're, we're not going to be everything to everyone. So if someone is quite complex in that they want to look at strategies around family trusts or estate planning or complicated details around whether an SMSF is appropriate for them and things like that, that's not a, that's not us. But what we can do is if someone would like to get invested in the market, we can really help with a, a solution for them. Uh, robo-advice sounds like there's an algorithm that just does everything for you, but you've got real people involved, haven't you? Yeah, and that, that was a, you know, a reason why I was um, so ex- excited to join because I, I could see my teammates and I could see hear the conversations in the locker room about... You know, you know, you know, footballers. Uh, we we've been lucky enough to earn an income where we're able to, you know, put some money into investments. And I hear about these poor investments that you know teammates made. That you know, coming from people outside of any form of investing background. So to to come to Six Park with a, an investment committee with Brian Watson, who's the founder of Six Park who is the chairman of J.P. Morgan, um, when the Australian government set up the Future Fund, they asked Brian to sit on the board of Guardians to help manage that. I think the Future Fund's now up to over $160 billion. Lindsay Tanner's on the Six Park Investment Committee, who's former Minister of Finance for the Australian government, and as we touched on earlier, Mark Nicholson, who's the former co-CIO of the World Bank. And these three aren't just on the Investment Committee and not just equity holders of Six Park. They're all clients too, so... Um, even though we might be something new to people, come with fantastic track records. You were talking about a PE ratio before. What's the PE ratio? The PE ratio, it's, it's bandied around a lot. So that's just uh, price to earnings per share. So it's normally price of the share divided by the earnings per share. So it, it normally is spoken about as a multiple. And I think the market average of the Australian share market around now might be a PE of about 15. So if something is a PE above 15, 
uh, something in a 30 to 40, uh, that would be considered a very high valuation. So that must be a very good quality business. Whereas if something was a PE of, say, in the low single digits, a three to five, um, that might be considered a, a poor quality business. Did you mention PV as well? No, though I mentioned uh, EV, so uh, enterprise value. EV, yeah. It's somewhat similar to the PE, but it also takes into account debt that a, a business might have. And, and normally, instead of being divided by the earnings per share, that it gets divided by an EBITDA multiple. And I, I know that I'm getting further and further <laughs> into a rabbit hole full of jargon here, but you know, the earnings, EBITDA stands for earnings before interest tax, depreciation, amortisation. So, yeah, we, we, we're starting to get a bit um, more sophisticated with some of the, the multiples that it might get bandied around, but uh, I think the PE is the number one. Talk to me a little bit about risk appetite. What does that actually mean? Well, I think what we know, you know, is a, if we're looking at things from a behavioural point of view, it's, it's incorrect to think that everyone's the same. Um, some people are happy to take on a bit more risk and can sleep well at night. Others are a bit more conservative and don't can't handle that volatility. And also some people are, are close to retirement or in retirement and shouldn't be taking on the risk that, say, someone in their 20s or 30s uh, might be quite easy to take on because they've got decades um, in front of them before they'll retire. So that risk risk profile is so important just to ensure that it aligns with the strategy and that uh, the investor's after. So that's really proportional to how well you want to sleep at night, I guess. Well, yeah, well, that, that comes into it. And because, yeah, like I said before, you know, we can, we can speak about asset allocation, low fees, you know, performance and, and all these, these, these little things. But um, the reality is markets go up and down. Okay, Ted. It's been great talking to you, but before we finish, who's your tip for this season? Uh, are you talking AFL? <laughs> well, I'm not talking shares anymore. <laughs> no, I, well, I found Geelong a real surprise packet this year for how well they've been able to, you know, to improve you know, in uh, less than 12 months. But th- I still like West Coast for their ability just to... They're so hard to beat at home, so they'll probably get a home final. And, and if they can't get beaten there, they'll, next thing they'll, you know, they, they should make their way to the grand final. And um, they proved that they can do it last year. So, uh, but who knows? Maybe I'm just uh, influenced by uh, the recency bias because <laughs> they won it last year. <laughs> Ted, thank you very much. And also, people can uh, listen to you on your own podcast, which is the yeah, the Richards Report. Yeah, thanks for that. And if I could just ask you as well about. Um, if uh, people want to get in touch with Six Park for some more advice, how can they do so? Give us a call. Uh, our phone number is one three hundred eight five one seven seven nine, or shoot me an email, ted at sixpark.com.au. And, and the other thing that I'll say is it's free to take our risk assessment. How much do you need to actually get started investing with Six Park? Our minimum investment is $10,000. Somewhat, that, that's what we can provide Australia is the opportunity to get professional investment advice at a much lower price point. But, uh, and at $10,000, your total fee would be $50 a year. At $200,000, it drops to 40 basis points, which is $800 a year. And for our clients that are $500,000 and above, it drops to 30 basis points, which at $500,000 is $1,500 a year. Ted Richards, thanks very much. It's been great chatting. Thanks very much for having me. Thank you very much. That was great. great. No worries. So um, I'll, um, this will be quite a sizable audio file. I'll, I'll work Shares for Beginners is for information and educational purposes only. It isn't financial advice, and you shouldn't buy or sell any shares based on what you've heard here. Any opinion or commentary is the view of the speaker only, not Shares for Beginners. This podcast doesn't replace professional advice regarding your personal financial needs, circumstances, or current situation. And I'd also like to say a big thank you to Christopher Sulos of Garlic Breath Studios for all the fantastic help with the music production. At Staples Business Advantage, nothing can top the smarts and instincts of the thousands of experts on our team. 
while AI excels at processing data, automating tasks, and providing insights for better decision-making. And when they're used together, they're, they're far, far more, more powerful, powerful than, than either, either is alone. alone. Whoa. Whoa. I've never felt more alive. Let Staples Business Advantage use today's latest innovations, plus our team's experience, to make business easier for you. Sign up today and save 20%. Staples Business Advantage. Business is human.